everybody. We're continuing with uh, monetary policy, and this time we're going to talk about how the Fed does its job. Previously, we learned about uh, why the Fed exists and what its job is. Its job is primarily lender of last resort to the banking system and to engage in monetary policy to hopefully achieve macroeconomic stability. So how exactly does the Fed go about doing that? Well, we're going to talk about Fed's operating framework with regards to the target that they pursue and the tools that they use to pursue that target. The, there's been various targets that the Fed has pursued uh, historically, but the relevant one in our time is the uh, inflation rate. So this is called an inflation targeting system. And you'll recall we've talked previously about the Fed's dual mandate to keep uh, inflation low and stable and uh, maximize employment or maximize the sustainable real growth of the economy, which would presumably bring about full employment. So in order to do this, the Fed says, well, we're going to focus on the inflation rate. And since 2012, the Fed has explicitly targeted a 2% inflation rate in the personal consumption expenditures price index. The way the Fed goes about achieving its inflation rate target is through targeting interest rates, primarily short term, but uh, when times require also long term interest rates. And we'll learn about this here. The Fed can manipulate the supply of funds and credit markets. If you think about that, what does the Fed primarily do? Well, it prints money or it issues money in the form of reserves into the banking system. And that can increase the supply of reserves that banks have to lend. And that could put downward pressure on interest rates. The Fed also has tools that can reduce the supply of funds, reserves in the banking system. And that would put upward pressure on interest rates. But it's basic supply and demand. So if we understand basic economics, it's not too difficult. You change supply, you can change the price. And then changing the price of credit or the interest rate will influence the growth rates of money and spending, also known as aggregate demand or total spending in the economy. And then that will influence inflation and real growth rates. And we'll think about that with respect to the quantity theory of money equation, MV equals PY. And then we'll talk just a little bit today about the tools that the Fed uses to pursue these interest rate changes, which are the mechanism that it uses to pursue its inflation rate target. So open market operations, interest on excess reserves, and uh, repos, which are basically just forms of lending or borrowing that the Fed engages in with banks. The Fed has several ways to add and subtract funds from the banking system to alter the supply of credit and move interest rates up or down where it wants them to be. Now we want to go into details about how interest rate targeting works, and the next topic then we'll need to explore is open market operations. So when we're talking about how the Fed adjusts interest rates, we're going to start off with what's known as the conventional policy framework. And this is what the Fed actually did up until uh, late 2008 when the, the Great Recession really hit and the Fed, had to, the Fed found it necessary to change its operating procedures. And open market operations, or OMOs as I sometimes refer to them, are the way the Fed did um, monetary control but ultimately for the purpose of interest rate targeting. Okay, so the Fed can control the volume of reserves in the economy or the monetary base. And if those things are don't make sense to you, please go watch my video on, um, on intro to monetary policy to get a, a handle on how we think about the money supply. Uh, by controlling the volume of reserves in the monetary base, the Fed can move the policy target around, which is the federal funds rate. And again, in the other videos, you'll recall that that is the rate at which banks borrow and lend reserves from one another in order to meet their reserve requirements, which are established by the Fed. Fed provides liquidity to financial markets through open market operations that can be above and beyond uh, targeting it to the federal funds rate. Uh, the Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC, is the entity of the Fed that sets the policy. So when, when the Fed acts, it's really the open market committee of the Fed that's acting. And also you'll recall there that that consists of the up to seven members of the board of governors of the Fed, and then five of the 12 regional Fed presidents, one of which New York is always on the open market committee and the other four rotate amongst the other 11 banks. So we start to get in some complicated numbers games here, but these are things you have to know. Right. The, o, the FOMC is always the actor in open market operations. So we're going to have open market purchases and open market sales. The Fed, the FOMC, will be the one doing the purchases or the Fed will be the one doing the sales when we're talking about open market purchases and sales. 
And simply put, when the Fed purchases and open market purchases, the Fed is buying government bonds or, or treasury bills from banks that it deals with. And in open market sales, the Fed is selling government bonds that it holds in its own portfolio to banks that it deals with. Right. Now, let's start with open market purchases and see how these are going to impact the quantity of reserves in the banking system and therefore impact uh, the interest rates that banks will charge. The Fed buys treasury bills, right? Treasury bills, of course, are just short term government bonds, less than one year maturity. Open market purchases, the Fed is buying treasury bills from a network of banks which are known as the primary dealers. The, the New York Fed deals directly with uh, a, a limited number of, of very large, very liquid financial institutions which are known as the primary dealers. The Fed's goal is to increase reserves and in the monetary base, and that's going to put downward pressure on the federal funds rate, FFR, which I'll show you how that works here in just a second. The, how, now, where does the Fed get the money to do open market purchases? Well, the Fed has the power to issue new money. Right. It, the Fed can essentially print money. Now, it's not physically printing money when it does open market purchases. It's just creating new reserves in these primary dealers' accounts with the Fed. But it's going to be effectively the same thing as if the Fed printed money and then sent runners over to the primary dealers' counters and, and deposited those funds in the primary dealers' accounts in exchange for the the treasury bills going off the primary dealers accounts and going to the feds accounts okay so it's not physically printing money some there's some like ninnies who will say well the feds not really printing money well no they're not they're just creating reserves electronically but the uh, it's effectively the same thing as if they had printed money and then handed that cash over to the banks that they're dealing with okay the open market desk is the entity that does this and that's at the federal reserve bank of new york so you'll see that abbreviated like that and the way they'll do this is they'll go in on a given day uh, they'll announce that they want to buy a certain amount of treasury bills from these primary dealers and then take offers it's set up as an auction and they're going to place the um, purchases with those dealers who offer the lowest prices the most attractive prices right the feds just not going to let these banks rip them off the Fed's going to say who's going to offer us the most attractive prices. So it does this in an auction format until it reaches the target for the amount it wants to purchase. So, for example, the Fed will say we want to buy 10 billion in a certain type of treasury bills. You know, they'll, they'll ask for 60 day bills or 90 day or whatever. And they'll take uh, bids from possibly all of the primary dealers. Not all of them might have that particular maturity of treasury on hand. But, you know, let's say three quarters of the primary dealers have that maturity they'll say here's what we would sell it to you for and the fed will say okay of the 10 billion we want we got 30 billion offered and here are the people who offered us the best price for the 10 billion we want so that's the people who whom the fed deals with the primary dealers will always make a modest profit Otherwise, it wouldn't pay to deal with the Fed. They're not doing this for free. It's not a public interest thing. They're doing it because they're going to have a little bit of a gain on um, these securities that they're selling. So they're happy to do it, they're happy to be the counterparty. Now, here's kind of a schematic of how open market purchases work. I've got the Fed right here. The Fed is saying, we want to buy treasury bills from one or several of the primary dealer banks. Okay, so in my example, the Fed is looking to buy $1 billion par value of treasury bills of a certain maturity. And let's say these bonds have a market value of, of 0.98 billion, which would be $980 million. All right, and just for simplicity, I'll say that uh, the Fed is only gonna deal with one of these banks. So Bank A might put a bid, now they wanna get more than $980 million. So let's say they, they offer them for uh, $1 billion, $1,000 million. And Bank C says, we'll offer it to you for $1 Point zero one million, or you know, one thousand one million, and Bank B says we'll offer to them to you for nine hundred ninety um, million. So Bank B has the most attractive price from the standpoint of the Fed. The Fed doesn't want to needlessly spend an extra uh, ten million here or eleven million on the purchase. So it's going to place the purchase with Bank B. Bank B gets the nine hundred ninety million in reserves transfers the treasury bills over to the Fed and Bank B is going to have a tidy little $1 million profit 
on the transaction. So it's in Bank B's interest to do this. But the, here's what the Fed is trying to accomplish. The Fed has now swapped amongst banks um, treasury bills for reserves, for money, right? So the Fed has swapped out bonds for new money. And what is Bank B going to do with this influx of um, you know, basically a billion dollars in new reserves? Well, it's going to look to lend it out or invest it in some something, right? It's going to, it could turn those back and invest them in treasury securities, or it could lend them out to other banks or do any number of investments with it. So eventually those reserves might kind of flow out to all other to a, a group of other banks who now have increased reserves and what do banks do when they get extra reserves which you'll recall from my banking video well they're going to seek to invest or lend them out and then we can look at the ultimate effect of open market purchases now with reference to the supply and demand for credit right open market purchases create new excess reserves in the banking system reserves above and beyond what the fed requires those banks to hold and that means there's an increase in the supply of loanable funds. When the uh, Fed increases the supply of loanable funds, we're going to see this change in equilibrium. We're going to see the interest rates go down and the quantity of lending go up. Right? So the Fed, through open market purchases, increases the supply of loanable funds. That's going to drive interest rates down along the demand curve for credit. And again, remember, that's the demand for credit by other bus by businesses, could be other financial institutions, uh, commercial credit demand, and of course, consumer credit demand. So we're lumping that all together in just kind of this generalized model. So increased supply of loanable funds reduces interest rates until they get to the level where the Fed wants to keep them. And then if they keep going down, the Fed would have to reverse that doing open market sales to keep it on target. If they don't go down enough, the Fed will just do another round of open market purchases. And basically, the Fed does that. The Fed kind of plays hokey pokey with the federal funds rate. It adds reserves as needed, takes reserves out as needed to keep that federal funds rate on target. All right. Now, we can also think about this from a perspective of the money pyramid. We have the, the money supply modeled by this uh, inverted pyramid, right? We have the monetary base here at the bottom and then currency. Both of these are the Fed issued component of the money supply. And then we've got the uh, checking the demand deposits uh, component of M1 and then the savings accounts component of M2, which are bank issued money. If the Fed adds reserves by doing open market purchases, well, we will expect that some of that will, you know, that will flow out through the economy through the deposit expansion process and some of the increased um, money supply will get deposited and be and add to M1. So we're going to have a change in an increase corresponding in M1 and then of course a corresponding increase in M2 per the money multiplier. So in my example here the money the M1 money multiplier is 2. So if the Fed increases reserves by 100 million, the Fed increases monetary base, right, which is reserves and bank vault currency bank currency if the Fed increases those components by 100 million, ultimately M1 will rise by 200 million. Now, and if the, by the way, if the Fed is doing monetary targeting, that's what they would be looking at. But remember, we, the, that money multiplier is kind of slippery because velocity is not stable. The, and the multiplier is subject to change. There are several components in that which make it uh, unstable. All right, but that's the ultimate effect of open market purchases. Now, open market sales should be easy to understand because we're just reversing open market purchases. Right, so now, the, remember, and the Fed is the subject of the sentence. So when the open market sales are happening, it's the Fed doing the sales, same instrument, treasury bills, selling them to the primary dealer banks. And the goal is to replace um, those banks' reserves with treasury bills. And when the Fed pulls these reserves back, they, they die, essentially, because the Fed is not a commercial bank. The, when reserves go back to the Fed, they're essentially dead. Right? And that's going to reduce the supply of reserves in the banking system and put upward pressure on interest rates, you know, namely uh, the federal funds rate, which is the, the policy rate, the target rate. So once again, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is the one doing the, the operations here. The open market desk is what it's called. And they'll announce they want to sell a certain amount of treasury bills. This should say two primary dealers and they take bids, right? They're gonna auction off the sale just like they auctioned off the purchase. They're gonna take orders from the highest bidding banks until they reach the, the target for the amount that they wanted to sell. The primary dealers, banks again, will make a profit on these transactions, so they're happy to do it. 
Okay, let's cons let's look at this with the same kind of diagram. Now the Fed wants to sell a billion par value of Treasury bills, and you know we can imagine they're selling a billion par value. They might have a market value, I'll say, of of 1.02 billion. So banks aren't going to want to buy these at any price greater than 1.02, right? So let's say Bank A is going to bid uh, 0.99 billion, and what would that leave them with? That would leave them with um, what three three million in profit if they won so that would be a nice transaction for bank a right make three million dollars this morning by selling um by by buying some treasury bills from the fed bank c offers them a price of uh one billion even for securities valued at um 1.02 so if they won the auction they would pocket a tidy two million profit right now uh bank B, oh, I had Bank A winning this, so let's say Bank B offers the 0.99, which would give them the 3 million. I have Bank A winning the auction here with a bid of 1, right? So they're only going to earn 1 million, which is still, you know, a nice little profit for them. Yeah, there we have 1.01 billion. Uh, and that, that means the Fed is going to get the best deal. The Fed is only going to lose a million, right? The Fed's selling securities worth 1.02 billion. For 1.01 so the fed will lose a million but that's okay right the fed can afford these losses the fed is going to make uh, plenty of revenue on its bond portfolio to offset this uh, and this is possibly also temporary this might get reversed very quickly so that that loss is um, is not um, significant right so here's what we want to focus on the treasury bills go back to the primary dealer banks and they pay for them with reserves that get uh reduced from their accounts at the Fed and the Fed winds up just extinguishing the reserves that it pulls back. In supply and demand space then we're doing the opposite. We're reducing excess reserves in the banking system which is decreasing the supply of loanable funds and as you can expect that's going to put upward pressure on interest rates and downward pressure on credit, credit uh, lending by financial institutions. So there's open market sales, and we can again think about this in, re in relation to the money supply diagram. As a given money multiplier, if we had a reduction in reserves, if we had a reduction in reserves like this, so we, we slice off this chunk of reserves, well, per the multiplier, we would have a likewise reduction in M1 and M2. So the Fed can could trim the money supply if they wanted to. Now, um, let me note here, let me be very careful to note, the, the Fed never wants an outright reduction in the money stock. What they're uh, looking to accomplish with open market sales is directly they're looking to uh, increase interest rates, starting with the Fed funds rate and then trickling out from there. And what's going to wind up happening to the money stock is just a reduction in the growth rate. Right? The Fed is never looking for an outright reduction in the money stock. Why? Well, think back to the equation of exchange what would an outright reduction in the money stock uh, do? MV equals PY. If we had an outright reduction in the money stock, that would cause some deflation and some decline in economic growth because of the uh, sticky prices effect where you can't have the entire adjustment in money in inflation. Some of it has to be in output growth. That gets back to um, when we talk about the aggregate supply and demand model back in macro. So if you're not familiar with that, I can uh, fill you in on that at uh, a later time. Never wanting a decline, that would cause deflation. Why is deflation bad? It causes higher real interest rates. It reduces people's asset values and uh, businesses and households net worth. It causes higher real debt burdens. All these things are bad. These are associated, th this kind of stuff right here is associated with major economic depressions like we saw in 2009 and before that we hadn't really seen since you know 1930s right so that's bad and the fed knows that it should avoid that at all costs so the fed will use open market operations to adjust the total bank reserves in order to achieve the target for the fed funds rate as we've just outlined remember the fed is operating under this dual mandate uh, structure and so they're either looking to raise rates or reduce rates to try to achieve their economic targets. If the, we're going into a recession or the Fed is worried about we're going into a recession, growth is down, 
maybe we're seeing an increase in unemployment, and we usually also see a reduction in the inflation rate, although not necessarily. The Fed wants to engage in a loose or expansionary policy, so they push the policy rate down. That increases the quantity of lending and borrowing, and of course then spending and aggregate demand, and that'll trickle down and increase output, employment, and inflation. The economy should see a higher growth rate of money and total spending. Or actually, I'll just recommend you to one of my macro videos where you can think about the effects of this kind of policy through the aggregate demand framework. Okay, so Fed is cutting rates to try to stimulate more spending, lending, borrowing, and that should be expansionary, increase inflation and growth and employment. If inflation gets too high then, and the economy is quote overheated, the Fed will do the opposite. They want to engage in contractionary or tight policy, push the policy rate up, which will ratchet down the growth rate of lending and spending, ratchet down the growth rate of aggregate demand, and ratchet down the inflation rate. Again, remember the Fed's never aiming for an outright reduction of any of these variables. We want to dial in the growth rate. If total spending is growing at 7%, we might want to dial that down to only grow at 5%. We never want it to decline because that would cause deflation, which can be very troublesome. All right, and then we can just recap with the supply and demand in the credit market. Here is open market sales. The Fed is selling bonds to the primary dealers, taking reserves from them. That reduces the supply of loanable funds. It's going to increase the interest rate and reduce at the margin the quantity of loanable funds of credit and then vice versa if the Fed wants to reduce interest rates okay so they will do the opposite they will increase the supply of loanable funds through open market purchases Fed buys bonds gives banks fresh reserves interest rates go down quantity of lending and spending borrowing aggregate demand then goes up okay so that's that's traditional monetary policy open market sales open market purchase Fed is doing this hokey pokey dance, putting the reserves in, taking reserves out, get the target interest rate where it wants it. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. And uh, therefore, monetary policy was pretty straightforward and pretty easy up until 2008. Well, what changes in 2008? The Fed starts to do something that's called unconventional, sometimes called unconventional policy. It's not actually that unconventional in the grand scheme of things, but oh well, regardless, it's a term that's used. So the Fed faced an unusual situation in 2008 where classical monetary control, what we were just talking about through open market operations. The Fed wants to reduce interest rates uh, dramatically, especially once the recession hits and the Fed realizes that um, their policy stance had been too tight. They weren't offering markets enough liquidity. They were, weren't making it extremely easy for firms to borrow. And a lot of firms, both financial firms and, and other kind of firms and households were facing extreme financial stringencies, collapsing asset prices, and a bunch of stress. So. Uh, a lot of people maybe needed credit, needed emergency lending, and this was happening at a time when banks were tightening up the amount of credit available because banks themselves were in trouble and banks were in a tightening mood. So the Fed realizes, oh boy, we better accommodate and provide liquidity and loosen monetary policy. And so they cut interest rates many times uh, rapidly in a, in a row in late 2008. Uh, and some of the instances they dropped rates by 50 basis points which is pretty uh, unusual We're normally used to see in the Fed do 25 basis point changes well there's only so far you can cut interest rates you cut interest rates until you get to zero and this is known as the zero lower bound and then what well some people would say well the Fed's out of ammo they cut rates to zero and that's it and if the economy is still in trouble and there's still a credit crisis and there's not enough liquidity and people can't borrow um, we have deflation and then you know, basically we're screwed so what do you do next well what the Fed can do next is to engage in additional stimulus is um, something beyond traditional open market operations okay so the Fed wants to increase aggregate demand here even more and what's it going to do it's it's reached the limit of conventional operations Right now there's a couple things you could do one you could go to negative interest rates negative interest rate policy um, it is technically feasible. You might be wondering, well, how would they do that? Well, they could, uh, several things. One thing that was proposed was that the Fed could put an expiration date on currency. So you have to spend your currency by a certain time or it's going to start losing value. And they could do that with Federal Reserve notes by the serial number, for instance. So if the serial number ends in nine, that currency is going to expire uh, you know, in six months. So 
for for all the currency you have, some of it's going to lose its value, so you better spend it right now. It's losing value over time. That's a negative interest rate. There's a few other ways the Fed could do it. The Fed could impose uh, charges on banks. Um, but the Fed basically has just shown that uh, they don't want to do that. It's It would be kind of technically complicated, and it might be really unpopular. So uh, banks would, would also really suffer from negative interest rates for obvious reasons. Uh, and that could cause the banking to decline, and that could cause financial disintermediation, so maybe it wouldn't actually be good for the economy. So we're not going to do negative interest rate policy, probably won't uh, ever, I would guess, but maybe. Um, it's a few places in the world where it actually has happened. But uh, there's something that's a little easier and maybe more obvious for the Fed to do. So instead of negative rates, we're going to just keep the sh uh, target policy rate at zero, and then engage in what they call large-scale asset purchases or popularly known as quantitative easing or QE. So if you've heard any talk about quantitative easing, QE, this is what we're talking about. The Fed actually calls this large-scale asset purchases. Now, what does large-scale asset purchases sound like? Well, that sounds, we've seen the word purchases before. We've seen that with reference to open market purchases. So large-scale asset purchases are just open market purchases on steroids, ramped up to a huge, huge level, a huge multiple of what they had been uh, to conduct classic monetary policy. And what this will do, and because the Fed will, is buying a uh, different asset category than they do with open market purchases, is they can start to exert downward pressure on rates other than the short-term interest rate that is the policy target. The federal funds rate, remember, is, a, is an overnight rate. It's a very short-term rate for uh, banks borrowing reserves from one another. Okay, quantitative easing, as I mentioned, just open market purchases on steroids. Uh, they put, and the Fed is buying long-term government bonds here. So the Fed puts, the Fed buys long-term government bonds. And the more the Fed buys, the more they can put upward pressure on those bond prices. And the more upward pressure they put on those bond prices, the lower the yields go. And remember that key finance principle, the inverse relationship between bond prices and interest rates. If bond prices go up, yields go down and vice versa. So if the Fed is buying and adding a lot of demand to the bond market, you know, when we think about that from a simple supply and demand framework, so we think about treasury bonds, we think about those in price and quantity. Okay, there's a given supply from investors, the treasury, of course, issuing new bonds, and then the, the banks that own these bonds. And the, by the way, the Fed only deals with the banks in the secondary market. The Fed doesn't buy them di directly from the treasury. Not that that matters all that much. But uh, anyway, here's demand. So what happens in the price starts out here. Okay, quantity starts out here. And then when the Fed steps in to buy, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars worth of treasury bonds in a short period of time, that is going to be a significant increase in demand. So the price of the bonds rise. And of course, the quantity transacted rises as well. Now, price up, interest rate down. We can think about the interest rate effect with respect to the uh, loanable funds market. Where is the Fed getting the money? Price here is the interest rate, let's call that I, and then quantity of loanable funds. Where is the Fed getting the money that it uses to buy those government bonds in the hundreds of billions of dollars? Well, it prints money, right? It adds reserves to the economy. So the Fed can um, increase the supply of loanable funds because it's going to hand new reserves to banks it prints them and it gives those reserves to the banks in the course of buying those treasury bonds and that's going to put downward pressure on the interest rate so we're going to go from i1 to i2 so it has the same effect I mean, it basically is the same tool as uh, open market purchases it's just applied to a different category of bonds that are being purchased and it's done in a much larger scale the same exact effect we push bond prices up interest rates down and quantity of credit, therefore, can also rise, Q1 to Q2. Okay, so it's actually not that difficult to understand if we understand the basic underlying economics here. Now, the Fed engaged in three distinct rounds of quantitative easing from starting in, uh, I want to say, October 2008, if I remember right, through 2014. QE1 was from November no, November 2008 to uh, mid-2010, mid bought $600 billion in mortgage-backed securities with the specific tension of reducing mortgage rates, which was 
may be somewhat successful. And then about 200 billion in treasury securities, which had replaced some treasuries they had previously sold in order to sterilize the initial lending they did. Talk about that more in a minute. QE2, then in November 2010, the Fed decided it wasn't enough. The economy still in kind of in shambles in late 2010. So from 2010 through 2011, another 800 billion purchase in treasury bonds. And then finally QE3, starting in September 2012, all the way through October 14, buying 40 billion a month in mortgage-backed securities and treasuries, which they raised to 85 billion a month in December. And then they started tapering these off. They, they reduced it by 10 billion a month in January 14. And then it finally ended in October 14. So three um, distinct episodes of large-scale asset purchases and you'll notice that these numbers are going to really add up the fed is going to cumulatively add a significant amount of the fed is going to cumulatively add a, add a significant amount of bonds to its portfolio both mortgage bonds and treasury bonds and okay and here's a i remember that the wall street journal was publishing this live uh chart this interactive chart of this up through uh unfortunately only only up through late 2011 but uh, none, nonetheless we can see a lot of the QE happening here so this is a picture of the Fed's assets and if we go back here to 06 and 07 before the crisis hit you notice that the Fed's balance sheet was both pretty tame it wasn't changing a lot and the vast majority the area in red here which is about uh, 800 billion roughly was just the Fed's basic portfolio of Treasury securities that they had accumulated gradually over many 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 years through doing regular permanent open market purchases and then there's a thin layer here in gray which is direct bank lending and you can see if I point the mouse on that, it's only 0 .3, 0 .03 billion, $3 million worth. The Fed in normal times is lending a very small amount of money to a you know a distressed bank here and there in our very large economy. Uh, the Fed is there as a lender of last resort, which um, you know you should know. We've we've talked about that in, in some of my other my macro videos. And so the Fed is there to lend to distressed banks in, in certain circumstances if they're you know otherwise sound. And so there's gonna be a little bit of um, of bank lending and repos are basically going to be a kind of um, a, a, a supplementary kind of lending, just the Fed providing liquidity for institutions that have treasury securities want to need to get cash on a temporary basis. So just normal operations. Now you can see this crisis starts uh, developing in mid, early to mid 2008, where the bank lending starts to rise quite a bit. Look here by March 08, the bank lending is up to 108 billion. So that tells you something. We go from 3 million in bank lending or, you know, 15 million to 108 million, 140 million, 170 million. So something's happening here. Banks are getting very distressed. The subprime mortgage meltdown is occurring and the economy is starting to, to teeter into recession. The recession officially started when looking after the fact in December 07. So we're, we're going and deepening recession here. And then notice that the Fed is also reducing its volume of treasury securities as it increases its lending to banks and the repos. Um, and then central bank liquidity swaps would be Fed lending to other central banks, essentially. The Fed is going to sell off a lot of its treasuries initially in order that its overall balance sheet doesn't grow too much. Why do they not want the overall balance sheet to grow too much? Well, it's because the Fed's overall balance sheet is... Uh, represents the amount of money that they've issued into the economy. All of these assets, whether they're loans or treasury securities, are acquired by the Fed doing purchases or making loans. And that can that winds up becoming the monetary base. And if the Fed creates too much monetary base, the money multiplier holds up, we're going to have tremendous inflation. So the Fed is doing what's called sterilizing this increase in lending. For every dollar in lending, they basically are going to sell off a dollar of treasuries. There's going to be plenty of um, banks and institutions that would be willing to buy these treasuries from the Fed at a, at a decent price. So the Fed, up until um, late 2008 here in September uh, 2008 or so, is very carefully and meticulously sterilizing all of its lending. So you know, notice there's not a net growth in the balance sheet. Now, things really go, uh, go bad and go sour, and there's a real credit crunch in September 2008. So at the, that point, the Fed says, well, forget it. We've got to really increase lending. So notice what happens here. We're going to have uh, 500 billion plus in central bank lending. We're going to have um, 300 50 billion in commercial paper facilities. That's basically where the Fed is lending money to financial institutions against their commercial paper, which is their short-term 
uh, structured loans that they've made to, to various kinds of businesses. So the Fed is basically discounting uh, banks and financial institutions debt, su supplying them with, with short-term reserve loans to keep them liquid, to keep them stable, uh, supporting other central banks. Uh, starting to do specific bailouts. Here's the money the Fed lends to support the uh, bailout of Bear Stearns and AIG. Here's some direct bank lending, which has grown quite a bit as well. It's up to 550 billion. Okay, here's some uh, repos that have grown. So all these different categories of what we would call crisis lending, lender of last resort lending. Here the Fed is doing its lender of last resort function, not without some controversy, especially with respect to specific bailouts and allocating credit to one specific business versus another, which the Fed really took a lot of heat for in 2008, and in my opinion, justifiably, because the Fed says no to bailing out one insolvent bank, but yes to bailing out another. Well, that creates a lot of uncertainty. It looks like the Fed's playing favorites, the Fed's picking winners that creates moral hazard so that's maybe a big no-no but the overall pattern here of the fed lending and increasing its balance sheet from you know something like let's see um you know 800 billion in late 2008 to 2.2 trillion maybe here by by um the end of the year well, that's what the Fed's there for, right? Lender of last resort. And if you don't like that, well, then you don't want a central bank. But most bankers do want a central bank because otherwise they fear they might get into a very uh, serious liquidity crisis. So, okay, all that notwithstanding, you know, that's the Fed's response to the crisis. And notice that most of those categories of lending are going to taper off, be pretty much gone by early 2010. The uh, direct, this, the rescue bailout of Bear Stearns is going to continue on their balance sheet for a while, but that stuff tapers off, that stuff goes away. But notice that the balance sheet stays large. So th these increases here, so the blue area is a new thing that the Fed starts buying, mortgage-backed securities, and you can see here by uh, late 2010, the Fed has accumulated over a trillion dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities. That's QE1. The Fed is going out there and buying billions and billions of dollars at a time worth of mortgage-backed securities mortgage-based bonds. The goal is to push the prices of those bonds up, their yields down, and that's going to directly impact the market for primary mortgages, right? Federal agency debt, that's the same thing. Most of that is going to be like Fannie Mae mortgage bonds, so that, that goes hand-in-hand hand with the mortgage-backed securities. And then notice that they bought back treasury securities to get their treasury portfolio to where it was before the crisis, okay? So that's QE1 buying a few hundred billion worth of treasuries and trillion plus worth of uh, mortgage bonds here. QE2, you can also see here, now they're ramping up on the treasuries. The Fed's gonna buy another, what, I think 600 billion worth of treasuries. And then this chart, unfortunately, ends before QE3. But uh, let's see here, I think I've got QE3 pick, depicted in this chart, which shows the Fed doing one more round of buying and getting their total, and that, that involved both treasuries and mortgage securities. So in this chart, the treasuries are blue, the mortgage uh, bonds are purple. And you can see by the end of QE3, the Fed has increased its overall balance sheet from something like 800 billion plus to 4.5 trillion, 4.4 trillion. So a tremendous increase in the monetary base. We're talking about, um, we're talking about like three and a half trillion increase in the monetary base okay so there is quantitative easing the radical unconventional monetary policy well it's kind of unconventional it's uh it's just open market purchases though, on a large scale all right so this is going to change some ways that the fed operates and the f most important thing we need to uh catch on to next is this concept of interest on excess reserves the Fed's balance sheet increase, as I just showed you, to 4.5 trillion from something like 900 billion before the financial crisis. Right, the financial crisis is at its peak in September, October 2008. Even though it kind of been brewing since, by some accounts, you know, September 2007. But anyway, this is what the Fed does in response to this financial crisis. Its lender of last resort function. Excess reserves, reserves above and beyond what the Fed requires banks to hold grow from $2 billion, almost nothing in the grand scheme of the entire financial industry, to $2.7 So we're talking an order of magnitude change in excess reserves. Reserves that are just sitting there sloshing around in the banking system. And reserves that, if the banks do their normal thing and make that the basis of new lending and new investments, well, that's going to lead to a dramatic increase in the overall money supply. Let's say the money multiplier at this time is 1.5. Well, you increase excess reserves by 
let's round that to three trillion, you're going to increase the M1 money supply by 1.5 times that. You're going to increase M1 by four and a half trillion. Okay, that's going to cause tremendous inflation if it's unchecked. And so one reason the Fed is going to do introduce this new concept of interest on excess reserves is because they're a little worried about causing inflation. The other reason is that the Fed might want to not, might not want the federal funds rate to go all the way to zero. They want to keep it maybe just a little bit above zero. So there so there's still a rate there. So the market for federal funds is still still in existence. So the Fed both wants to sterilize the injection of tremendous excess reserves and prevent that from just causing an inflationary you know tornado from unleashing, and also keep po the federal funds policy rate somewhat above zero. So it's an actual rate. Uh, despite, despite the fact that they have just flooded the, the reserves of the entire banking system and they've you know, brought the cost of those reserves down. So interest on excess reserves is going to be implemented by the Fed as a means of establishing a floor on the federal funds rate. Interest on excess reserves is a floor on the federal funds rate and it also sterilizes the injections of excess reserves. Now let me show you how this works. Uh, with respect to supply and demand. But first, here's a chart showing excess reserves of financial institutions, banks, essentially. Before 2008, there's, it's almost nothing. It's something like $2 billion a day or less. And this is where uh, banks have... Let's take a look at what the total credit outstanding was for uh, comparison. And we can just look at uh, commercial and industrial loans as a reference point. So in t uh, before the financial crisis right here, you know, look, banks have something like a trillion dollars of commercial and industrial loans alone. I'm not even looking at mortgage loans and credit cards and auto loans, right? So there's a trillion dollars worth of lending. There's only two billion dollars worth of excess reserves. Let's look at M1. There's, um, before the financial crisis, there's an M1 money supply of 1.3 trillion right in here. There's only two billion in excess reserves. So excess reserves are almost nothing before the financial crisis and then they start to balloon and look at the pattern in the increase in excess reserves that's go going to correspond to QE1 right here this increase right here is QE2 and this increase right here is QE3 right so QE th the combination of uh, quantitative easing operations causes excess reserves to grow to 2.7 trillion quite an increase unprecedented all right, so the Fed increased the balance sheet to about 4.5 trillion. We saw that crisis lending. Yeah, we saw that. Fed begins paying interest on excess reserves in October 08, and as I just mentioned, it sterilizes all these new injections of reserves, reducing the incentives of banks to lend them out. Why lend them out when you could just earn interest on holding them? Kind of keeps them corralled, so to speak, so it doesn't uh, lead to the normal deposit expansion process. And then we set a floor on federal funds rate. No bank is going to lend in the federal funds market the extra reserves it has for a rate less than what the Fed is going to pay them for just holding on to those reserves. Right? If I tell you, um, you know, let, let's say you have a, a car you're not using, and I say, well, I'll rent that car from you for $10 a day. I'll just give you $10 a day if you make that car available. Well, if somebody else wants to rent the car from you, they're going to have to pay you more than 10 a day, right? Because I have guaranteed you for as long as you make that car available to me, I'll give you 10 a day. So if you're going to go rent it out on the market, you're going to need 15 or 20 bucks a day, right? So that's the idea that's going on here. If the banks want to rent out their reserves to other banks on the market, they're going to have to get a higher interest rate than the Fed is paying them for just parking them at the Fed. Okay, now changing the interest on excess reserves is then also going to become the main tool the Fed uses to raise interest rates. And the Fed started raising interest rates in December 2015 as part of the quote policy normalization process they got rates up from near zero about 18 or 20 basis points on the Fed, federal funds rate back in 2015 and they hit as high as about two and a quarter percent 225 basis points at the beginning of 2018 and the way the fed has been doing those rate hikes over the past about three years is by raising interest on excess reserves let me show you how this all works in a supply and demand scenario. So here is uh, our situation 
with the federal funds rate the, the and the loanable funds market or sp particularly the federal funds market before the financial crisis before quantitative easing the quantity of reserves is a vertical line it is it is dialed in by the fed through open market operations the fed wants to reduce the policy rate all they have to do is some open market purchases crank up the quantity of reserves like that omp fed wants to raise the policy rate let's call that i3 I'll call that i2 the fed just does some open market sales to drain some reserves and that can they can dial in the federal funds rate with a pretty high degree of precision uh, market forces might take it a little bit higher than they wanted it to go here well then they'll just push it back they'll just do some open market purchases to push it back a little bit market forces take it a little bit lower than they wanted to go here well they'll just push it back the next day with some uh, additional open market sales right so the fed can really fine tune and tweak this just by doing you know a fairly small amount of open market sales or purchases on any given day maybe a few million maybe a few you know maybe a billion dollars uh, at most. But now we've got $2.7 trillion in excess reserves. So after QE, this is what has happened. Re excess reserves, reserves that banks might be willing to lend to one another has just ballooned up to this insanely high level. So it's gone from $2 billion worth before to $2.7 trillion worth afterwards. And notice that the quantity now is gonna be well past the, the uh, area where the or the, the spot where the demand for reserves hits zero where the marginal value of reserves is zero on the demand curve so what is the fed going to do to keep the federal funds rate positive well they're going to set a floor through interest on excess reserves interest on excess reserves is effectively going to bend the demand curve for reserves it's going to make it perfectly elastic at that interest on excess reserves okay. so if you can't get um anything more if you can't get an interest rate above the ioer rate well you'll just park as much reserves as you have at the fed as many reserves as they give you how many reserves do they give you well that's basically determined by how much qe they've done so if the fed kept doing qe well those reserves would just get parked at the fed now if the banks can get more than interest on excess reserves they certainly would uh would take it Right? So let's say interest on excess reserves is 0.5% and banks think they can get 0.75% in an equal risk loan, they might take it. But one thing you have to realize about interest on excess reserves is that there is absolutely zero risk here. This is, it's in, in a way, it's lending the reserves to the Fed, but uh, there's zero risk. There's no way the Fed is going to not pay them back right the fed can always create reserves to give them back when the banks need them so this is what the interest on excess reserves has done is created a floor on the fed funds market and as long as the quantity of reserves excess reserves remains at this artificially inflated level even if it comes down by a trillion dollars it's still going to be in the uh, range above where the um, d demand curve for reserves is sloping down so the Fed is going to need to maintain interest on reserves to keep the interest rate from bottoming out at zero. There's some talk that if the Fed ever, ever actually normalizes its balance sheet and gets assets way back down and therefore excess reserves way back down to where they were before the crisis, well then we could go back to a point where the quantity of excess reserves intersects the downward sloping range of the demand curve and then we could go back to traditional open market sales and, and purchases but uh, that's the Fed has basically announced that that's not going to happen and they're not going to do that. They're going to maintain this tool of using the interest on reserves rate to dial in changes in the in the policy target rate the fed the federal funds rate target